And the EU is very deliberately constructed to reflect that. The EU Commission, which we constantly refer to as poor, ignorant, foolish, suckered Brits, we constantly refer to as the European Civil Service, is not. It is the prime body of governance. It is the origin of almost all law. Similarly, the European Court operates as... I'm here I'm really teaching my grandmother, but it operates essentially according to the principle of a key. In other words, there is a goal. There is a goal of European unity, and every single decision tends to that goal. And there is a constant process of accumulation towards it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, again, an a notion like the public interest. The public interest in France does not mean what me, we mean by the public interest. The public interest in England is a product of a huge process of diverse disputing little people all competing and arguing with each other and finally an inspector, poor man, having to weigh all these little pieces of competition against each other. The public interest in France means what the elite perceives it to be. It is deductive, which is why, combined with <coughs> highly effective bribery <coughs> and, very large, um, and, and, and very large bulldozers, it's so easy to build a high-speed rail line in France and so quite extraordinarily difficult to do it in England. Unless we modify our planning system to the equivalent of theirs, which is now in active discussion. Now, this, I think, highlights some very important points. It seems to me that the Roman way and the English way do differ in some absolutely fundamental ways. Law in the Roman tradition is essentially the product of will. It is essentially the product of the sovereign will. Law in the English tradition, obviously there is will, there is the will of the sovereign or latterly that pair there, the sovereign parliament. But two other elements seem to me to be extraordinarily powerful. One is the idea of consent, and the other is the idea of representation. And these ideas seem to me to be absolutely fundamental, and they are, of course, so intimately associated with that institution that we are electing today, or rather one member of which we are electing today, Parliament. It very quickly becomes developed in England that law is only of universal and binding authority if it is passed by Parliament. What is Parliament? What is this body that can bind everybody that whose consent is presumed, that the consent of everybody is presumed to everything that it does? And again, as early as the 14th century, the judges react to people claiming we can't possibly be bound by an act of parliament uh, because we weren't there, um, we, 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 uh, our little community wasn't represented or whatever. <clears throat> the judges have a perfect formula. It is that everybody is presumed to be represent, everybody in England is presumed to be represented in Parliament, either in person, that is the king, a peer, lay, or ecclesiastical, or by his representative, that is if you're a countryman, it is a representative of your county MP, or if you're a townsman, by uh, your burgess uh, or your citizen who is the MP for, for your little community. And this idea is one of remarkable power. And it seems to me it is unique. You will find no other European legislative tradition that places this emphasis on representation and consent and also on participation. And I think that point about participation itself is also very important law to bind. And when, as I said, I was a young man, um, we also said things that now again, nowadays again seem rather strange, that the English are a naturally law-abiding people. Now, anybody who's looked at the number of his predecessors who uh, were murdered in various rather horrible circumstances know that that isn't strictly true, or the prevalence of riot, urban riot, particularly London riot in the 18th century. On the other hand, it does seem to me that this notion of law as the possession of a people 
was powerfully ingrained in the English mind. And it seems to me that a law that does not seem to those who are subject to it to be their common possession, the thing that they have created, the thing that they have owned, is not a law that works. Again, one of the striking things, and it's, it's now much less clear than it was, but it certainly, uh, uh, in the 19th and early 20th century, it was very clear indeed. Why constantly, again, using this convenient dialogue of what goes on on the two sides of the channel, why are the English constantly accusing their bureaucrats and government of gold-plating European legislation? Why are we constantly saying um, that, okay, you know, the French and the Germans, well, possibly not the Germans who have got their own uh, sets of problems there, um, but the Italians and the Spanish, you know, are perfectly happy to, to, to assent to a law, and then what do they do? Well, they don't obey it, and they make absolutely sure that they don't obey it. Why do we have this attitude of, well, it is the law, therefore it must be obeyed to the letter? Well, obviously, the element of letter is precisely the point that I've been making, the inductive notion of law. Therefore, the literal meaning, the literal verbal meaning of law is quite extraordinarily important in the English tradition as, a, as opposed to the much floppier uh, Roman tradition. But I think it goes beyond that. Because of the idea of parliament, uh, because of the idea of consent and representation, law is still, and 50, 100 years ago, was much more powerfully felt to be something that you had actually shared in the making of. It was part of you, and therefore you were morally obliged to obey it. Now, if you're Irish and see law as an English imposition, if you're Italian and see law as something that the Austrians shoved upon you, you don't think like that. If in Greece, remember, well, we, you know, Greece is a rather interesting test case too. Remember Greece, this, all this nonsense about the cradle of democracy and whatever. Uh, Gre Greece is a rebellious province of the Ottoman Empire. And it's entirely incomprehensible what is going on there against any other. You know, history really is, on the whole, I think the Greeks are just, uh, uh, you know, Ottomans that happen to go uh, orthodox. But there we are. Um, uh, which, is, which, of course, is why their food is identical. Um, <coughs> and, uh, but, but obviously, See, you see law, you see what I mean? You see law as something completely different. Again, uh, in, in some colonies, uh, law again seen as utterly opposite and different. And one of the marvelous things about India is that India seems, on the other hand, Hong Kong seemed to be seeing a law that was essentially an English or a British law as increasingly part of themselves and defining themselves. So this idea of consent of representation is utterly fundamental. I think it also goes along with something else. It, and, and th therefore, of course, uh, our sense of the possession of law weakens as we feel that Parliament itself is less effective and less, 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 less representative and so on. But it also goes along with something else. If one looks in the, 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 the two different traditions, the English and the Roman, it's not simply the machinery of making law uh, that's different or popular attitudes towards it different. It is actually the nature of legal process itself, which is quite radically different. Um, and let's look at two extremely important areas, law enforcement and the actual judicial process itself. If one looks in the Roman law tradition, normally law is enforced by a quasi-military body directly uh, uh, answerable to the, to, to, to the central state, to usually <coughs> the imperial authority. And uh, the gendarme, uh, the gendarme, what is a gendarme? A gendarme was the original standing army, of, a member of the original standing army of the French kings. It is um, a quasi-military, or very often wholly military. Again, one looks in Italy, one looks in all of these countries. There are highly militarized police forces, which from the beginning were always armed. 